Hi, with this video I want to talk about multivariate normal distributions and point out some of the really uh, amazing characteristics that multivariate normal distributions have that, that makes us lean on these multivariate normal conditions very heavily in a lot of our analyses in engineering. Okay, so first of all I want to, um, I'm going to build on the univariate and bivariate normal um, e equations that we uh, first started with. So in, in those cases we can kind of spell things out in, in detail and, and look at them. When we get to more than two variables, um, that strategy gets ugly. We already saw this z term that kind of got long with the bivariate normal case. Once we have three random variables or more, it really gets ugly. But if we switch to vector notation, things actually stay quite uh, nice. So let's introduce that first, and then we'll talk about the multivariate normal distribution in just a moment. So um, I'm going to introduce some new notation here. So I'm going to uh, let's go back to one variable. So if I had one variable, I could talk about x. So this this would be my um, scalar random variable. And then we'll, we'll put a little tilde and then write an n. And I'll, I'll just uh, let's uh, put a little n there. That's, it means that it has a normal distribution. And so we know that it's got a normal distribution, so we know it's going to use that normal distribution PDF. But that PDF also has a couple parameters in it, right? The mean and the standard deviation, uh, or the mean and the variance equivalently, which, which is just the square of the standard deviation. So those are our parameters. Right? So rather than writing out the PDF or writing out a sentence to say x has a normal distribution, I could just write x tilde n, parentheses, the, the mean and the variance parameters that I'm interested in. And this is nice because it works, it extends very nicely to a, um, a vector of random variables. So now I'm going to have a vector of random variables, and I'll denote with an x. And I've got most of this um, written out ahead of time. Let's, let's scoot it over even a little more to organize myself. So x is a, a vector of random variables. And, and actually, I'll denote, I'm going to write it down here, kind of spelled out. So it's going to be this vector x1, x2, x3, up to xn. So it can be n dimensional, where n is an arbitrary amount. And then, um, as long as we're kind of getting started here, let's, let's make one more note here. So the bold on here, or, or the underline when I write it out by hand, uh, is going to indicate a vector or a matrix. So that's how you can tell that it's not a scalar. So I intentionally wrote that x in a bold. OK, so I've got this vector of n random variables, x1 through xn. And I'm going to say that those have n has a normal distribution, so the same um, concept as above. But now it's going to be multivariate normal. But now I've got to specify a bunch of parameters, right? So I have to specify the, the mean values. So I've got, let's just do it kind of by, partly by spelling this thing out. So, the, so my mean, I'll, write it, I'll label it down here. This is the mean vector. So I need a mean value for each one of my random variables. So x1 has a mean value mu x1. x2 has a mean value mu x2. xn has a mean value mu xn, and, and so on. Okay, so I'm just going to denote that bold m as a shorthand for that vector of all those mean values. And then I need a um, covariance matrix. All right, so this is my bold sigma. It's going to be this big matrix here. And it's a um, n by n matrix of the covariances between all of the x's with all the other x's. All right. OK, so that's, uh, that's how we're going to, those are all the parameters we have to, to spell out. Right? So instead of a single mean and a single variance, I now need a mean vector and a covariance matrix to specify all the means in the standard deviations and all the correlations between the different x's, which are embedded in these covariance terms on the covariance matrix. OK, so if I've got those things spelled out, then the joint distribution has a PDF that's actually pretty easy to write. Um, so I say the PDF for bold x 
Now, so instead of having to write out x comma y or x comma y comma z, I'll just write bold x down here, which is kind of all the random variables I'm interested in. I'm going to have to specify a vector coordinate lowercase x, which is the numerical values of all those um, values in the vector. And it's got the following PDF here. So I've got 1 over 2 pi to the power n over 2. So that looks kind of like my square root of 2 pi or the 2 pi that I had in my previous cases. This n is the n from the previous slide. Uh, so it's the number of random variables. All right, so we want xn, x1 to xn. It's the same n here. And then in the, um, um, I, I guess let's, let's go through this a little more quickly and then we'll compare it. I've got the determinant of the covariance matrix to the 1 half power. And then I have an e to the minus 1 half. And remember, we started off with an e to the minus 1 half x squared. I've now got an x times an x, but it's the vector x minus the mean matrix. Vector x minus the mean matrix. I transpose one of these vectors, and then I multiply in the middle by the covariance matrix inverse. All right? And there's a bunch of parallels here that, th again, this, this could look a little intimidating, um, but once we compare it back to the univariate case that we built up from, uh, it's not terrible. All right? So remember, in the single variable case, I've got it down below. We had a 1 over the square root of 2 pi. In the bivariate case, we had a 1 over 2 pi. So we're going to keep that pattern up. We're going to still have a 1 over 2 pi, and we're going to add, basically add a square root of 2 pi for each dimension of x. So in the n equals 1 case, we've got 2 pi to the 1 half, which is a square root. In the n equals 2 bivariate case, we've got 2 pi to the 2 over 2, so just a 2 pi, and so on. In the single variable case down below, we've got a sigma x. In the bivariate case, we had a sigma x times a sigma y times the square root of the 1 minus the correlation coefficient. And that thing was going to keep getting bigger as we added more variables. But it turns out it's just the determinant of this covariance matrix. That's got the sigma x and the sigma y, and it's got the correlation coefficients. So we just take the determinant of that matrix to the 1 half power. That's a pretty standard uh, matrix operation, so that's not a terrible thing to compute, or at least a, not a terrible thing to ask your computer to compute. OK, then we've got, in the single variable case, we've got the e to the minus 1 half. That continues. We had an x minus a mean value squared. You can kind of see that, right? I've got an x minus a mean value, an x minus a mean value. When I transpose one of them, then I've kind of cross multiplying all the terms um, against each other. So I end up with this um, something comparable, but in a vector format. In the univariate case, I also have this sigma x squared in the denominator. So that's the variance of x in the denominator. In the multivariate case, I've got the covariance matrix, which kind of plays the role of the variance. I can't divide by a matrix, but I can invert a matrix and multiply it in. So that's, that's kind of the matrix equivalent of dividing by this matrix. So the sigma x, um, sigma to the minus 1 plays the role of, of kind of the sigma x in the denominator. All right. And if I did this in the bivariate case and expanded it out, it'll look just like the bivariate um, equations that we did in the, the previous video. Okay. Uh, I guess one more thing we can we can note here is that, so remember x and the mean matrix, um, if we go back a slide, those were both had kind of n entries in them. So this is a, um, maybe I'll just denote it here. So I've got x is an n minus, n by 1 vector, the mean matrix is an n by 1 vector, and the covariance matrix is n by n. So if I look at this matrix operation in this formula, right, the the covariance matrix is n by n. Its inverse is also going to be n by n. The x minus the mean, those are both n by 1 matrices. But when I transpose it, it's going to be a 1 by n. And then the x minus the mean on the end, that's n by 1, because I didn't transpose it. So if I take an, a 1. 1 by n matrix multiplied by an n by n matrix, I'm going to get a 1 by n. If I take a 1 by n multiplied by an n by 1, I'm going to get a, a 1 by 1. Right? So the result of all this matrix operation is a 1 by 1 matrix. It's all going to collapse down to a scalar, which is good, right? Because I'm going to get e to the minus 1 half times this scalar, um, which is going to give me a scalar. And so my probability density function is scalar. So it's got a vector input of this vector uh, of of x values I'm interested in, but it gives me a scalar output of probability density. Right. And this, this thing here, this is giving me kind of high dimensional um, 
it's the equation of like high dimensional hyperellipses for a constant value. So there are like hyperellipses in, in n dimensional space where this probability density function is constant, just like there was uh, ellipses in 2D space where the probability density function was constant. So the same thing kind of holds through here. Okay, so that's the formula for the multivariate normal distribution. Now let's talk about, um, a, I'm gonna quickly list some properties and then I wanna go through them in a little bit more detail. So here's some, some great properties we're gonna take advantage of. Let's, let's just list them out quickly and then and I'll go through in more detail. So first is that the first and second moments of the distribution, um, the mean and the variance specifically, those completely define the distribution. Uh, next is that lower order distributions are normal. The third is that conditional distributions are normal. The fourth is the lack of correlation implies statistical independence. So if, if terms in um, that vector are uncorrelated, uh, the vector of x's are uncorrelated, that means that they're going to also be independent. And then the fifth is that if I take this multivariate normal set of random variables and I put it into a linear function, the output from that function is also going to be multivariate normal. Okay, so those are some, some great properties. Let's hit each one in a little bit more detail. Okay, so the first thing is that um, these first and second moments completely de define the distribution. So here's my PDF formula again, just repeated from a couple slides ago. And I see, again, I've got some matrix operations and, and things like that floating around. But the things I have to specify, right, so I've got to specify um, the number that I'm interested in, but that's just a parameter of the distribution. That's nothing uh, um, that has to be like derived ahead of time. It's just the number I'm going to give in to get an answer out. The only things I have to specify to define this distribution is this sigma matrix and this mean vector, right? So I've got kind of the first moment, M, the, the means, and then I've got this covariance matrix that I use twice, and this is the, the second central moments, right? So I took the, to get the, the variance or the covariance, I take the second moment where I take the expected value of, of xi minus its mean squared, or the expected value of xi minus its mean times xj minus its mean to get the covariance terms in that matrix, right? So those are the only things I have to specify. I don't have to come up with any extra parameters, just means and, and covariance matrices. So that's great. Um, you know, those matrices can be big if I've got a big, um, set of random variables, but that's actually the simplest possible parameterization for a, a random variable that's uh, you know, somewhat flexible. There's plenty of ways in which these x's could be have some other distribution where it's not sufficient to only know the means and covariances, but you might need to know additional parameters. So this is a pretty simple to define distribution. The second property is that a lower order distributions are multivariate normal. So, so let me explain what I mean here. So we say if this big vector x has a normal distribution with some mean matrix and covariance matrix, like we've been talking about through the whole video, then um, if I define an x uh, which is equal to a stack of x1 and x2, and, and maybe why don't I spell this out even a little more, um, so I could say, um, you know, let's, let's take the x and I'll underline here in place of bold because I can't draw bold very well. So this is the big vector of x1, x2, x3, so on down to xn. What if I wanted to split that? And I said, okay, well, yeah, I know there's, there's n of these random variables that we were talking about. I'm only interested in the first two. So let me split this out and call this, um, you know, the vector x1, x2, and apologies for kind of re reusing the one and two notation, um, but basically x1 vector is just gonna be scalar x1, x2, and x2 is gonna be the rest of everything, right? x3 down to xn. So okay, all I care about is x, is the, the vector x1, I don't care about all the rest of it. Let's, let, let me just worry about this. Well, it turns out x1 is still multivariate normal, okay? So I've got, that's what I got spelled out here. So if we take x, split it out into x1 that has its own mean matrix, the mean of x1, mean of x2, and it's got its own covariance matrix, then 
this x1 is still normally distributed, and all I need is the mean matrix and the covariance matrix for the terms that are left in x1. And similarly, the leftovers, x2, the, the remainder of the terms, that's also normally distributed. Okay? So if I have a big vector of multivariate normal random variables, any subset of those random variables is also multivariate normal. Okay? So that's great. Once we're in, we're, we're in for good. Um, I think that's enough for, for this one. Okay, um, the, and, and, sorry, one more thing to say here. So all these properties, I tried to kind of queue them up with the bivariate normal case, right? So we talked about if X and Y were bivariate normal, then X by itself is marginally normally distributed. That's kind of the 2D version of this, right? So, that, so the same thing also works at higher dimensions. Okay. Um, conditional distributions. So if I've got conditional distributions and I, and I define my X1, um, uh, vector and my x2 vector, just like I did on the previous slide. I say I've got some some portion of the this x vector that I want to condition on, and say let's say the x1 is equal to some known values, and I want to know about the distribution of the remaining terms in that vector. Well, it turns out it's multivariate normal. Okay, so x2 is is multivariate normal conditional on x1 equaling something, and Further, the, the mean vector and the covariance matrix are easy to compute. So I'll say the mean, uh, so this is the mean matrix for x2 conditional, uh, let's just say given, I guess. Same thing, given that x1 is equal to some number x1, and uh, uh, not number, some vector x1, because we can condition on a vector of um, terms, okay? And, and we see, okay, well, that, so that's this, this mean matrix that I would need to evaluate the multivariate normal distribution. I'm gonna start off with the original mean matrix for x2, and then I've got this operation here that relates to the mean matrix for x1 and how much different the, the value I'm conditioning on is than that mean, okay? And remember the bivariate case that we introduced. We said that the, the mean value for x given y, which is kind of the um, equivalent here of this mean matrix, right? It was the original mean value of x, and we see the original mean matrix um, on the left-hand side. And then we've got a term which is the correlation coefficient for x and y. I'm going to run out of space here. Let's tighten this up a little bit. So we've got a correlation coefficient for x and y. Um, and then we had a sigma x. And then I'm going to write. I'm going to draw in a. a do I want to do this whole thing? Yeah. So originally we had a sigma y in the denominator, and then we had a um, y minus the mean of y as our last term. Okay. So that's the that's the bivariate case. And then just to, to normalize or to kind of draw some comparisons, I'm going to multiply in a sigma y in the numerator, and I'm going to square the sigma y in the denominator. So I didn't change anything here. And the reason I'm doing that is because now I've got um, this term here, sigma rho xy times sigma x times sigma y. That's the covariance between sigma x and y. And that's equivalent to the sigma two one term that I've got over here on the left, right? So that plays the role of this sigma two one term here. Now the sigma one one term, this is the, the covariance matrix for the stuff I'm conditioning on. That looks like the, um, the sigma y squared term here. So this is like my sigma one one inverse, right? Cause it's in the denominator. So it's like inverting a matrix. So the sigma two one, sigma one one inverse, you know, looks like these, these terms that I have out of the bivariate case, and then I've got y minus the mean, which is kind of equivalent to the x1 minus the mean of x1 over here on the left-hand side. All right. So, so this is kind of the vector version of the bivariate case that we we looked at previously. If that helps you kind of trace through what's going on here. 
because I know these these matrix operations with inverses of covariance matrices and things can be hard to follow. Okay, um, so that's the, the mean. Then the covariance matrix, that's the other thing I need to evaluate this, this normal dis distribution. So I'm gonna have the covariance matrix for x2 conditional on x1. And we're gonna start with the original covariance matrix and then subtract this other thing off here. All right. So again, let's look at the bivariate case first. And I'll do this over on the side. Um, so we had that the, the standard deviation of x conditional on y. It was originally um, the standard deviation of x um, times the square root of 1 minus the correlation coefficient squared. Right? And that was the correlation coefficient between x and y. So here, to get the analogy with the, the left-hand side, which is maybe not obvious just yet, let's square both sides. So I'm going to take the conditional standard deviation squared. That's that's kind of what the because the covariance is a squared. I'll square the right-hand side. So I'll make the sigma x squared, and I'll just take off the square root and make this just a one minus rho squared. Okay. Now let's expand out that parentheses. So I've got a sigma x squared. Then I've got a minus uh, rho squared xy sigma x squared. And now I'm just gonna multiply and divide by a sigma y squared to get my, my form equivalent here. So now I've got um, the sigma x squared. So that's gonna play the role of like the sigma two two over on the left hand side. Then I've got um, this correlation coefficient squared times sigma x squared times sigma y squared. This is like a sigma 2, 1 times the sigma 1, 2. That's kind of all the cross terms between the conditioning terms and the, um, the variable that I'm left with. And then the sigma y squared in the denominator, this is like my sigma 1, 1 inverse. Okay, So not, not a totally direct uh, comparison with the bivariate case formula that we looked at a few slides ago, but you can kind of see all those terms, how they how they show up in the in the vector version here for the multivariate random variables. Okay, so in the end, if we specify this covariance matrix for x, we can partition it off and grab off the 1, 1 and the 2, 2 terms. We can do these matrix operations pretty cleanly, and we end up with a new covariance matrix, which is the covariance matrix for this conditional distribution. And then we're off to, to go do our calculations. All right, let's look at the next property. So um, the next property is that if, I'd, if any of the variables are independent, uh, sorry, if any of the variables are, are uncorrelated, so they have a lack of correlation, that means that they are independent. independent. And we did this for the bivariate normal case as a, as a worked out example. Let's take a look at, um, at what happens in this multivariate case. So if I have z correlations of zero, that means that the covariances between um, you know, an xi and an xj are zero. So the covariance matrix, if, they're all, if, if all the correlations are zero, the covariance matrix is just a diagonal matrix, where I just have terms on the diagonal that are the variances, and everything off diagonal is zero. Right. OK. Um, and so if I partition that that covariance matrix into the x1 terms and the x2 terms, right? I have zeros on the off diagonals. I've got a, a sigma 1, 1 and a sigma 2, 2. Those are also diagonal in this case, but they need, need not be. The key is that these kind of off diagonal partitions are zero matrices. And so if I look at the previous slide, right? this is, this is my um, sigma 1, 2, and this is my sigma 2, 2, two 1 terms um, when I partitioned up that matrix. And so if I go look at this previous formula and I say, well, what if I condition on x1? Let's take a look at these formulas, right? So I've got a sigma 2, 1 and a sigma 1, 2 term here. If those are zeros, then this whole second term in my conditional covariance matrix is all zero. And my covariance matrix is just going to be the original sigma 2, 2 covariance matrix. Similarly, this conditional mean vector is going to be the original mean plus a term with a sigma 2, 1. If that's a zero, then this whole second term here disappears. And my conditional mean is just my original mean values of my random variables. 
So my conditional mean and covariance matrix are just the original mean and covariance matrix, matrix, which means that conditioning on the x1 had no impact on my means and standard deviations, and so it has no impact on my distribution. And that's the definition of independence, that conditioning on x1 doesn't influence the values of the x2 vector that I'm interested in. Okay? So that's convenient, right? So if I can establish lack of correlation, then I know I have independence of my random variables, and that'll simplify calculations in a number of situations. Okay, final um, property here is that linear functions of multivariate normal random multivariate normal random variables are also multivariate normal. So here's the here's the setup. So I've got a, a, an x which is multivariate normal as before. And it's, let's say it has n elements in it. I can multiply it by some matrix A and add some vector B. Uh, maybe I should do these separate. So this is going to be a A is a matrix of constants. And then let's, let's write these out separately, I guess. B is going to be a vector of constants. Okay, so if, if, if x is multivariate normal and it's, this is an n by 1 vector, I can pre-multiply by an m by n matrix, as I've got kind of written out in words here, and I'll get an m by 1 vector. And then I could add an additional m by 1 vector of constants b. Then um, the result of that operation is going to be this, this vector of random variables y, an m by 1 vector. And y is going to be multivariate normal as long as x is multivariate normal and a and b are constants. Okay? So, um, so that's convenient because we've, we, y still has all these great characteristics that we just talked about. And further, it's, it's really easy to find the distribution of y as well. So I know it's multivariate normal, so I know the functional form of its PDF. And further, the mean value of y I can find by simply plugging the mean value of x into that above formula. So I'll take the, the, the mean value of x, multiply it by that same matrix A, add the same vector b, and that's going to give me a vector of mean values for y. Similarly, the, the covariance matrix for y, so I'll, I'll call it bold sig sigma and subscript yy to indicate which one I'm talking about. I just take the covariance matrix for x, pre-multiply it by a, and then post-multiply it by a transpose, where a is that same matrix, and I get the covariance matrix for y. So this is great, right? Those, those are just two easy matrix operations that give me the means and the covariance matrices that I need, and then I'm off to the races computing anything for y. Okay? So, um, so this is really helpful, right? It's telling me as, as long as I'm only doing linear operations, I can just stay in this multivariate normal space through all the operations I need, and, and we use that all the time in engineering calculations. To, to think about a random variable example, I could think about um, y being some measure of like the response of a building to um, excitations over time, and so the, um, you know, the, the, the location of my building at any point in time is a kind of a linear function of the loads that have occurred in, in previous points in time, as long as the structural response is linear. And so I can come up with an equation of this type of form, which relate where, where x is kind of my load over previous moments in time, and a and b relate to the characteristics of the structure and how it's responding um, to, to impulses over time, and then y will be my displacement. And so I can say, well, as long as those loads were multivariate normal and can be described by x's, then my response y is still going to be uh, normal. And even my response at multiple points in time can be multivariate normal. And I can still take advantage of all these nice characteristics. So there's a bunch of situations like that where we can utilize these, these benefits. OK, so, so let's start wrapping up this video. I, I know there's kind of a lot of notation here. Um, but hopefully, kind of talking through that notation with some words and drawing a few sketches gives you some sense of, of what's going on. And then I think for me, you know, starting with the univariate and the bivariate cases gives me a little intuition in, in dimensions that I can visualize so that when we go to these high dimensional problems, we can, we can still have some intuition to build on. Um, you can see that this, this matrix notation really helps a lot once we go to higher dimensions. Um, and you know, some of these formulas might look a little bit uh, um, opaque. You know, I've got this, I've kind of got this long formula with, with matrix notation, but if we back it out to the bivariate case and then back it out to the univariate case, we can see it's still just, in the end, it's kind of this e to the minus x squared type of functional form. 
and it, it's really a convenient functional form to work with. It gives us all these nice properties as we've talked about in this video. So I hope that gives you some, some sense of what's going on and, and gives you a, a sense of all these, you know, these are just some of the properties kind of, to me they're the most useful properties, but there's even more properties that multivariate normal distributions have that are really convenient for a lot of calculations. Okay, so let's stop there.